thank you very much. It's always uh, particularly pleasurable to come back to Vancouver, where some of my best friends are, some of whom are in the audience, and to remind myself of uh, what a wonderful city this is and the opportunities that it gave to me to research and publish in an area that I was passionate about since I was a graduate student. And as I was reminded by the very kind introduction, I've been sort of uh, want running around in these waters of suffrage and social activism and issues around social policy and social control for more than 50 years, which makes me feel even older than I feel now. Uh, and as a reminder to us all that there are careers that are worth pursuing. I know when I was six, I wanted to be a historian. Um, and I never changed my mind. I was one of those fortunate people who knew exactly what I wanted to do. So that introduction was fair. And today, I continue the conversation that I have with myself, uh, with my colleagues, both in uh, history and in women's studies and gender studies and indigenous studies across the country about what are the issues that we need to recollect and how can we best recollect them and how can we give uh, you know, a fair coverage of the past while remembering that the past, like ourselves, had you know, many um, qualities that we would now consider shortcomings. How do we come to a balanced assessment? And I think of what I've been doing since I started writing, and I think my first publication was not, in fact, the National Council of Women, but was on an introduction to In Times Like These in 1972, which is you know, the memorable vo volume by uh, Nellie uh, McClung, who was Canada's certainly most well-known, is still the most well-known of the suffragists. So at the end of my career, and I'm reassuring my friends who have to listen, who have had to listen to too many stories for now 40 and 50 years about whatever I was working on, that actually I'm coming to the end. My stories now are to do with who's going to take the zucchini in my garden. <laughs> um, but beyond that, beyond the zucchini in my garden, and indeed my small dog, that I talk about incessantly. I'm finishing up a project that I've been uh, interested in uh, for some time, and this is the story of Helen Gregory McGill. And Helen Gregory McGill is often uh, a suffragist that people take for granted, uh, not as forgotten as so many of her contemporaries, indeed like Mary Ellen Smith and Laura Jameson, uh, whose biographies I've written in the last couple of years, because there was this wonderful biography that was written uh, by Elsie McGill, My Mother the Judge. And that came out in the 1950s and became, in fact, in some ways, a sort of standard uh, volume to consult about uh, the suffrage movement, but also about uh, legal reform, about uh, women's rights generally, particularly mother's allowances and minimum wage in British Columbia. Um, and so I had always sort of thought, oh, well, uh, you know, she, Helen Gregory McGill um, doesn't need any much, doesn't need much more work. Um, there's a lot of work to be done, and we could put her, you know, somewhere in the, the distance. But as I, you know, went through COVID, went through a hip replacement, I was trying to look for for a, a person that I could concentrate on uh, using some of the same sources that I used for Mary Ellen Smith and for Laura Jameson. And these are heavily newspaper sources. Um, so I could sit at my computer at home and have the world of the internet open to me in ways that uh, we're very fortunate to have. So much of what I have today sort of adds to the picture and perhaps complicates the picture that uh, her daughter presented in My Mother the Judge, uh, but reminds us there's so much more work to be done. Now, the title of this talk, and all titles are works in progress, Defying Convention, is a title that would fit, in fact, any of the suffragists or the feminists uh, today or 100 years ago or 150 years ago. They were defying convention. They were defying uh, resistance to equality in many of its forms. 
And of course, particularly uh, for feminists, you know, the issue of equality is to do with women. And it has often, in Canada as elsewhere in the world, often to do with white women, with middle class women. Uh, but the suffragists were a diverse group. And I want to suggest that uh, Helen Gregory McGill, who starts off and indeed has a, a career uh, before she becomes a, an unruly Ontario debutante at age 16 in Hamilton, and then a University of Toronto, she's dubbed the pocket vent Venus uh, when she graduates in the 1880s. Then she's a bohemian uh, new woman journalist in the United States and in Canada, and then she finishes her career, although not her life, which goes on a bit longer, as known as BC's little judge, because she was just about five feet tall, so quite tiny, um, and that was often remarked. So um, in the last, uh, I guess it's been about a 10-year project, all in all, I've been the editor of the general series on suffrage and democracy for the University of British Columbia Press. And this was an effort to bring together the newest scholarship on feminism, suffragism, equal rights, and democracy in the period from about the 1850s through right through the 1960s. And I was able to corral a number of folks who, if they weren't friends before, became friends in the course of our investigations. And this was an effort to remind everyone, uh, because it's too often forgotten, that suffrage is a democratic movement. It isn't a democratic movement that includes everyone. Um, there were always some folks who were excluded, and we'll talk a bit about exclusions as we go along. But it was a much more diverse, and indeed, we could argue, inclusive movement um, than is often uh, suspected. And we started off with A Hundred Years of Struggle, which was Joan Sangster's. And I have to say, every one of these books uh, has won a prize and sometimes several. So the first one that came out was in 2018, I think, and that's Joan Sangster's 100 Years of Struggle. And so what Joan really wanted to do was to place the suffrage movement within an international global context in which Canadians were part of a grand movement that was trying to push the frontiers, particularly of parliamentary, but also uh, political democracy uh, more general. So it's generally, and so these networks were very important, and it's the diversity, um, and Joan shows this by including uh, the involvement of indigenous people, uh, blacks, Asians, and Canadians from a variety of social backgrounds. The second volume, Our Voices Must Be Heard, was by Tara Brookfield, won the prize for the best book in Ontario when it came out, I think, in 2020. Uh, and again, what Tara's tried to do is to demonstrate how diverse and in some ways unpredictable that movement uh, was in Ontario. And then to be equals in our own country. And you should note that the title of this book uh, has several messages to tell you. It's about women being equal in Canada, but it's also about Quebec being equal in Canada. And Denise Belergeron really lays out the very complicated trajectory uh, of the suffrage movement, uh, both English and French, in Quebec. And then we have Sarah Carter's Ours by Every Law of Right and Justice. Um, which is on the Prairie Provinces, and she's the first uh, person to take a broad look at how the three Prairie Provinces differ, uh, but also shows similarities in terms of their attitude to Indigenous people, for example. Then we have a great revolutionary wave, and I think Lara Campbell has talked for you already. And so Lara's book also won multiple prizes. Um, and what she demonstrates, particularly for British Columbia, of course, is the importance of the North-South uh, contacts between California, Oregon, Washington, and BC, uh, but also the contact, contacts with um, the UK and the importance of socialism, uh, particularly in British Columbia. And then finally, the volume that came out um, last fall by Heidi MacDonald, We Shall Persist, which is uh, on Atlantic Canada. And Heidi wants to argue, and has argued I think fairly effectively, that uh, once again we can't dismiss the Maritimes as an area of conservatism where everything was slower to take off and people were less progressive and less radical than elsewhere in Canada. So what 
all of these authors have done is they've recovered a tremendous uh, diversity and also a very large number of both women and men who were suffragists. And in fact, I'd like to appeal to you here, or anybody who's watching us on, on YouTube, is to follow up the traces um, that you can find in these books about people who really need more attention. Because it you know tends to be said that suffrage was the uh, you know cause of a tiny obstreperous and difficult minority, uh, but what they all show is that it was fairly broad based in its support, and people express their support and their differences about what they envisioned happening uh, in the course of some fifty and often more years of campaigning, and so. What I'm going to say tonight is very much in the context of my having edited these six volumes and learned a tremendous amount in the course of uh, doing so. Then, okay, yes. And then more recently, I became involved in um, two studies. Uh, and as always, I think, uh, as a historian or anyone studying either con contemporary events or the past, is you, you tend to, to pick people that, you're particular, that you find in some way at least sympathetic. And Laura Jameson, um, who comes from, the, uh, the, uh, comes from Ontario, comes from a dirt scrabble farm in Ontario, uh, has a very common trajectory through teaching, um, before she marries, uh, a lawyer comes to live in uh, Burnaby and in turn also becomes a juvenile court judge and then goes into the provincial legislature. And she's in the provincial legislature in the 1950s, so she is the last suffragist standing. Um, and I was very fortunate with the study of uh, Laura Jameson to be in contact with her granddaughters, who have uh, very full memories uh, of their grandmother. Um, and I was able to augment um, the reliance that you often have in women's history of when there's a lack of official sources, you're using newspapers, but I was able to use the memories of her granddaughters. And then with uh, Mary Ellen uh, Spears-Smith, who's another extraordinary person, very overdue for a biography. She was, of course, the first uh, woman uh, elected to a provincial legislature in Canada. She has a fascinating uh, history coming out of uh, Northern Britain, uh, involvement in cooperatives, uh, the liberal labor movement in uh, the coal mining districts, uh, but also evangelical Christianity, uh, particularly Methodism and someone who was very much the heart and soul of suffrage, uh, first of all in Nanaimo where they first settled, and then in Vancouver. Um, both of these women um, are obviously white. Uh, neither of them start off as middle class. They both start off as you know, the daughter of poor farmers who could barely make a living, uh, working class uh, woman uh, whose uh, talents as a pianist and as a musician uh, allowed her to uh, move within polite society, certainly when she came to Ottawa when her husband, where her husband was an MP. But the working class roots were really important. And uh, there's really, uh, no other person uh, like Mary Ellen Smith, you know, anywhere in the country, and you'd be hard put to find her like anywhere uh, in the rest of the world uh, in terms of the first suffragists. Uh, this is the first uh, biography that came out, and as I said, has, is a very rare example of an early biography of a suffragist. Uh, there are sometimes, you know, brief mentions or even, you know, something approximating an article on this first generation. Um, uh, but this biography is an unusual example of something, of a biography that's very, very favorable. Indeed, one of the problems is, is that it is a fawn daughter's reminiscence. And I've since talked to the granddaughters, or in the case there's now only one left, the granddaughter of Helen Gregory McGill, and she reminded me, um, which you don't see in the, in the uh, 
uh, commentary on this book, is that Elsie uh, carefully cleaned up her mother's life. So there's all sorts of things that are missing. And the things that are missing are particularly to do with men. Um, not surprisingly, I have three sons. I think of all the things I don't think about when I think of uh, my sons. Um, but with uh, Helen Gregory McGill, uh, her father, her grandfather, her brothers, her sons, her uncles, all bring something uh, to this campaign. Um, but Elsie Gregory McGill really wanted to provide a rather um, sanitized version of her mother's life. And her granddaughter, uh, who is a, uh, a archaeologist specializing in Syria in Oxford, says, you know, you could really, uh, my, my, my grandmother uh, needs a serious biography that takes all of her life seriously and not the cleaned up version uh, that Elsie provided. And so when I've been thinking about her, um, I've tried to think about uh, what a non-cleaned up version of her life would look like. First of all, why Helen Gregory McGill? First of all, she's clearly part of the diversity of the Canadian suffragist movement. Unlike the two women I've written most recently about Mary Ellen Smith and Laura Jameson, she comes from an upper middle class family. Um, she grows up uh, in a series of mansions uh, in um, Hamilton. Her grandfather is a leading member of the Ontario Bar. And she's presented as a debutante both in Hamilton and in Ottawa subsequently. So she comes from a very privileged background. It is a background, however, that is complicated by the fact that the women in particular in her family, and this goes back three or four generations, are involved in a variety of movements, notably for the reform of uh, the Anglican Church and offering more room uh, for uh, missionary efforts on the part of women, both as foreign missions and domestic missions. But also her family was directly involved in in the town of Mount Pleasant, which is quite close to Hamilton, in which had a very active suffrage movement, and I'll talk a bit about that in a minute. Also that, like many uh, Canadians, she was closely tied into the American suffrage movement. She knew many of the suffrage uh, leaders out of the United States. Uh, she wrote to them, um, she asked their advice, uh, and they remain influential when she comes to British Columbia. Uh, there's a lifelong commitment from the time she's a teenager uh, till the time she dies in her 80s uh, to equality. And she continues to face resistance, resistance, dismissal. And I have to say, despite the fact that she starts off as a moneyed, a member of a moneyed family, she ends her life the same way Laura and um, Mary Ellen do, with very little money. Um, they're, they're living very much on the margin, and indeed Helen is supported by her two daughters. Uh, the pensions that are available are, are, are very, very slight, and she experiences significant, I think, economic hardship. What's also interesting about Mary Ellen, or sorry, about Helen Gregory McGill, is that she her life complicates assumptions regarding race. And it is true that many of the suffragists are middle class, they're white, they're a member of a settler society that is largely disinterested uh, in indigenous people and sometimes uh, fearful of Asians and blacks. Her career, however, shows uh, that this story is a more complicated one. It isn't a question of, of complete indifference or dismissal. Um, and we can see uh, that one of the problems with her being remembered as a judge is that she has to be neutral in politics. So in the period that she's a judge, she can't comment on political life in British Columbia. So she doesn't comment, for example, on the internment of the Japanese, although she clearly uh, disapproves of it. So she's restricted in what she can say, but there's a number of indications that she is one of the more advanced suffragists in terms of their response to Asians uh, in particular. Um, and then finally, it's worth revisiting Helen Gregory McGill because this long 
well over 100 years of uh, a feminist legacy that comes directly through her family. And this is, of course, why Elsie uh, wanted to write My Mother the Judge, because she wanted to recover this golden thread that linked her great-great-grandmother uh, right through to, her, to the daughters, uh, the two daughters of Helen Gregory McGill. Okay, so one of the problems, of course, in being in, in British Columbia is that we're far from Ontario, where and in Ottawa and in Toronto and in Hamilton, uh, there's additional sources. And COVID's uh, difficulties uh, made some of the recovery more difficult than I would have liked. While there has been quite a bit of work done on the labor movement uh, in Hamilton by uh, Craig, uh, Craig, uh, Greg Keeley and Craig Heron, uh, and a number, number of others. Very little, in fact, has been written on uh, the women's movement that accompanied uh, or developed simultaneously alongside uh, the labor movement. And this, uh, the life of this family, the Gregory family, and before this, the O'Reilly family in, in Hamilton was, is very much a story of women who are heavily engaged in setting up institutions for women and children, um, uh, a variety of protections against violence, reform of the penal system, um, and also involved in Six Nations. Um, so this little girl, Helen Gregory, Helen Gregory as she is then, uh, she will know that her uh, great aunts, her grandmothers, uh, were not only involved in Six Nations as part of the missionary enterprise, which in the day was seen to be progressive. And I think you know, we need to make the distinction between what we regard as progressive today and what might be regarded as progressive in the past. So she had um, connections with Six Nations that continued on to uh, Vancouver. She was also very involved in uh, the feminist network uh, associated both with Toronto and with Mount Pleasant. So with um, the leaders of the first uh, suffrage movements or suffrage clubs in Toronto, her mother was involved. And indeed, it was said that her, certainly her grandfather uh, was supportive. Her grandfather was a Tory, Miles O'Reilly, very influential uh, lawyer and judge in Ontario, and someone who had defended the rebels in, in the 1830s, although he was known as a Tory, um, but someone who was very involved with notions of equity and who was very close to his granddaughter. And that, was a, he was very influential for her. And also her uncle, her mother's brother, Edwin O'Reilly, who was uh, mayor of Hamilton. So they came from this very respectable elite of activists. Okay, this is uh, Helen Gregory McGill at 16. And as she said, when she was 15, she came out as a, as a suffragist. And the, the problem was, she came out as a suffragist, very much supported by her mother in particular. Uh, but her father uh, didn't want her uh, to be schooled uh, anywhere else but at home. And she had a very inadequate governess in her teens um, and someone who didn't prepare her for the Latin and Greek that were necessary. Uh, to enter university. So a very, uh, uh, an experience of being privately tutored um, that she found later to be a major uh, disadvantage as she was trying to envision her life in the new world. But she, she and her mother were very much a hive of reform activity, uh, a part of Hamilton's uh, reform activity. One of the problems for me, writing from this coast, is that the Hamilton Spectator, which is otherwise a wonderful newspaper, is one of the Canadian newspapers that has not been put on uh, the web. So it has not been digitized. And so one's ability to recover the very particulars, and I, I've now read, you know, I, I think, well, over 50 years, I've run, read many of the newspapers uh, in Canada for the period between about 1880 and 1940. Uh, but the Spectator uh, has been a problem. I've just managed to drop in and out of the Spectator. But the Spectator is an important newspaper. Um, and for someone who wants to continue work on uh, 
uh, Helen Gregory McGill, I recommend the, the Spectator as a source of a great deal of information about uh, the suffragists of Hamilton who have really been invisible in the otherwise uh, productive scholarship on Hamilton. Okay, so unfortunately with uh, Helen, uh, with uh, my mother, the judge, uh, there are no footnotes, okay, so that the daughter just selects pieces of her mother's letters and autobiography uh, that she wrote, and then she destroyed everything, okay? So you just have a series of quotes that sometimes aren't dated, usually not sourced, um, and so you can use them, but you have to use them in the context of other kinds of information as well. And one of the pieces of information, but, but it is filled with you know, clues uh, as to uh, Helen's leanings. And one of them is that she early on wanted to be a lawyer. Uh, her grandfather was the most distinguished member of her family. She wanted to follow in his footsteps. Uh, but the Law Society of Ontario was not admitting women, um, and of course she hadn't been well tutored. So initially she decides, uh, like many women of her generation, is that she's going to make music her career, both as a composer and as a pianist. And she's clearly uh, very talented, she passes the British exams, she eventually gets into U of T courtesy of her uh, grandfather who presses Trinity College, known then as Trinity University, to admit his granddaughter. And they admit her, she comes in, she can't take classes with the young men, uh, but she can write the exams. And she writes the exams, so she's the first woman in the British Empire uh, to become, get a, uh, a, a Bachelor of Music, and she stays on then to get a Bachelor uh, of Arts as well. She continues, however, even early on, uh, to write a series of articles clearly influenced by her grandfather on the importance of law. And she takes quite a progressive stance, you know, well before uh, she gets appointed as a juvenile court judge and showing her interest in law. But it's something that she can't take on because she won't be admitted, she can't be admitted to the Law Society. Now where she does look for employment, and so she finishes her studies at U of T in her early 20s. She's clearly looking around, what am I going to do? Uh, because although her grandfather is a noted man in Hamilton, her father is basically a ne'er-do-well. Um, he really never makes it as uh, a businessman. He likes to see himself as an artist, as a poet, as a museum, uh, a musician. Uh, and someone whose uh, money-making capacities uh, are quite limited. So she's finding herself in a position where she has to make a living, uh, but it's unclear how she's going to make a living. But it's interesting when she goes to U of T and then when she's introduced as a debutante in Ottawa as well, she's always accompanied by her mother, very rarely her father. So she's accompanied by, by her mother uh, and also in visits to the United States where she addresses the Canadian Club of New York, for example, on Canada. And she's still doing this as a very young woman in, in her early 20s. The person uh, who's clearly very influential for her, and you see this in the articles that she writes later on, is uh, Sarah Jeanette Duncan who's probably Canada's leading new woman journalist and who lives just down the road in Ontario in Brantford. A little bit older, not a lot older, but three years older uh, than Helen Gregory McGill is. And someone who really sets the measure for being a uh, feminist with sort of global aspirations who wants to comment on both politics and society. And she manages to uh, travel widely. She's very well known in Canadian newspapers and American newspapers. And a very influential uh, person in terms of a model. Uh, given that she can't be a lawyer, uh, she can't make a living as a musician, uh, and journalism seems to be a possibility. And Sarah Jeanette Duncan is also a, a model, is that she also reports on the development of uh, the Northwest in Canada, but more particularly thinks about China and Japan as places that are worthy of the travel of a new woman journalist and worthy of commenting on. 
and very much escaping uh, the restrictions of Ontario society. And uh, Helen writes about her it, uh, quite a bit over the course of the, oh, the 1890s and the period before the First World War. So you get uh, quite a bit of attention in the press, and they're unfortunately not long articles. If you know 19th century newspapers, these are sort of typical little tidbits that come through that remind you that uh, Helen Gray Grew McGill is quite uh, well known as a young woman uh, who's interesting, who has important social connections. Her grandfather, for example, is a friend of John A. MacDonald. Uh, she's uh, introduced into society in Ottawa uh, by John A. MacDonald uh, and his wife. Uh, but she finds quite soon, as indeed do many of the women journalists in Canada, that there is a community of high society, women and men, that are worth writing about, and that people are worth, are, are people, readers are worth, are, are interested in learning more about them. And this will be the basis of her career, is this visibility as a high society young woman uh, making interesting, uh, doing interesting work uh, in journalism beginning in the 1880s and then in the 1890s. So, now, probably the, where she comes to greatest attention is in a trip that she takes uh, to the Northwest Territories, as they are then known in 1890. Uh, she writes a series of articles, and we're, we're told in My Mother the Judge, and we're told in various uh, biographies, short, shorter biographies of Helen Gregory McGill, uh, that she writes uh, articles for the Globe and Mail and a series of very uh, high-profile American magazines. In point of fact, really it is the Globe and Mail and Canadian magazines in the early 1890s. I haven't managed to track down you know, anything significant that she's writing in the American periodicals before the end of 1890. But she does write for the Globe and Mail and she writes on uh, the Mennonites, um, the Icelanders, the Crofter colonies, and they're very sympathetic. They're actually some of the best stuff that she writes, because she goes on later to write uh, extensively for uh, American newspapers and magazines, and most of the stuff is pretty lightweight. She's not a uh, writer, uh, I think, on the same level as Sarah Jeanette Duncan. Um, but this early work that she does shows, I think, sympathies that are interesting given her suffrage history. And I just draw your attention to the piece that she publishes in the Globe and Mail in 1890. Uh, and this is looking at Kewatin, uh, which is Manitoba, and where she writes, Whitefish is, of course, the great staple of this region um, from Lake Winnipeg. And at every reserve came the same cry from the Indians that the lakes and rivers are being fished out. Does that sound familiar? It is to be hoped that the government will cause immediate and searching inquiry to be made as to whether there is just ground for fear. The language Cree sounded soft and melodious, and when Chief Thomas and his counselors spoke their, spoke their gesticulation was graceful and dignified, nay at times even grand. And so again, I think we have to read, um, we, have to, we have to search for comments like this, which help us to see a much um, you know, broader vision of uh, what's happening in Canada than is often credited to the suffragists. Okay, when she goes east, uh, the assumption is that she's going to write these articles uh, for the Golden Mail and for Cosmopolitan in New York, and that she will go on uh, to cross uh, the Pacific and to be present in Japan when the Japanese diet uh, is inaugurated. And so she is on her way first to the Northwest, then to Vancouver, and then she crosses uh, to Tokyo and to Japan 
more generally. So she gets involved and she goes without a chaperone. So it's the first time in her life that she has been without a chaperone. Although she does have a lieutenant governor of, of Manitoba. She becomes part of his party when he's touring uh, Manitoba and she writes on the basis of this relationship with John Schultz, uh, who's clearly very sympathetic. And at this point, uh, she also has family in Manitoba. So like many uh, residents of Ontario, there was this land rush uh, to Manitoba in the 1880s and 1890s, and both her mother's and father's family took part in it. She had a half-brother in Winnipeg. Uh, she had a number of cousins uh, in uh, the Northwest as well. But she's assigned to Frederick Charles, or Lee Flesher, uh, who's also the son of a fairly distinguished, uh, at least well-known uh, conservative family in Ontario who had moved to Manitoba in the 1880s. He's three years younger than she is, and he takes her around to see how uh, the farms are developing in Manitoba. And after one month, she marries him. So this is something that would not be acceptable and was not acceptable in the social uh, community of which she was part. Um, and it's quite interesting if you read My Mother the Judge because the two daughters are both daughters of the second husband, not daughters of Lee Flesher. But Lee Flesher is the hero of that story. So he's the hero of their mother's story. So the man they never meet, the father of their two half-brothers, is a man who's brought up in the free atmosphere of small pioneer towns. Lee was a high-spirited extrovert, extrovert who rode like an Indian, was a crack shot with a revolver, and possessed uncommon energy and purposefulness. Uh, and again, was an, clearly an extraordinary person, stood six feet, two inches, was handsome with regular features, fair hair, and brown eyes. He wrote verse, sang in the choir, was well-educated, and had an attractive manner and a kind heart. And he was clearly a feminist and very supportive of Helen Gregory as she was then. And he was swept off his feet as she was swept off her feet. So she marries him on August 1st uh, in a very small Anglican ceremony in a very small church with only two witnesses. So it's not known by her family uh, back east. They both adopt, immediately adopt, Gregory Flesher as their common name, which is very unusual in the period. And Helen, in the beginning of November, uh, heads for Japan. So he accompanies her to Vancouver, spends some time with uh, her brother, who's also in Vancouver working as a stevedore, and sees her off to Japan. Well, then life gets a great deal more complicated, because yeah. if you read the newspapers, what happens on her way to Japan is that she's throwing up steadily as she crosses the Pacific. And those of us who are women in this audience know what that means in your early 20s. So she gets into uh, Yokohama and she clearly knows she's pregnant. And, but here she is, she spent her whole life at age 26 uh, looking for a way to make a living, to make a mark on the world, and she's not going to give up this opportunity. So she comes equipped with uh, introductions from the Aberdeens, from uh, various former and present uh, governor generals, from, jo uh, from John A. MacDonald, indeed from Laurier. Uh, so she moves in the highest ranks of Japanese society. Uh, she also gets introduced to the women who are the early, the foremothers of the Japanese suffragist movement and part of the feminist movement uh, in Japan. She writes about them and indeed they become an inspiration for her uh, subsequent writing for the, I guess, the next 20, 25 years. Um, she also writes in some of the very important magazines in Canada and the United States, including Gaudi's magazine in 1893. And she talks uh, very movingly about uh, the efforts of uh, Japanese women. In particular, that much of the regrettable in her position, the position of Japanese women, is due to her dependence, is quite clearly evidenced 
by the fact that the peasant wife more nearly approaches her husband in freedom and equality than the empress, simply because she can, if necessary, and frequently does, share in the money-making <laughs> labor. And this is, will become a constant refrain in her work, is the importance of economic uh, support and recognition of women's contribution to the family economy. She said, I would like to say that the Japanese woman is more than clever, she is absolutely brilliant when we take her opportunities into consideration. John Stuart Mill, in the subjection of women, in answer to a sneer that they had done nothing in literature, said he had not the slightest doubt that if men had not filled the literary field, the woman would have created a, the national literature. So she stays friends with women uh, such as uh, Nabishima Nagako, who is uh, today well known as an early Japanese suffragist. She also gets introduced to the presence of intermarriage between Asians and whites, and that intermarriage occurs at some of the highest uh, points of, of Japanese society, and the woman who's also important for introducing her to uh, Japanese society is in fact a German, uh, Elizabeth von Reda, the daughter of a German aristocrat, was born in Russia, and her husband was a very progressive samurai, diplomat, and politician, who was regarded as, as the really the instigator of the, the part, much of the New Japan. So she enters into Japan at a time when much of Japan is embracing modernity. And one of the characteristics of modernity uh, for women such as these, and indeed for Helen Gregory McGill, is uh, the equality of the sexes. Now she comes back, she, she had intended to spend a year or so in Japan, uh, but by the time she leaves for um, Japan in November, she's about three months pregnant. Um, and she rushes back uh, in early February uh, with uh, a great uh, a cartload of uh, uh, writing on Japan um, that she's going to draw on for the rest of her life, as well as presents from the Japanese aristocracy who think she's coming back for her first uh, wedding and before she's coming back for her second wedding, which is associated with considerable scandal because her father, um, who's born in Quebec, thinks that the only way she can recover her reputation is to get married properly in the Anglican Cathedral uh, in Hamilton. Um, they're not sure that she got married properly, although we, we do have the documentation, and she kept the documentation that she had married properly. But by the time she gets married in the Anglican Cathedral, she's about five or six months pregnant. Uh, and she's only, you know, five foot. And it's an enormous baby when the baby arrives. And as her daughter discreetly puts it, there were those in Hamilton not ill-pleased to see the remarkable Miss Gregory get her comeuppance. And this is, of course, the story that never gets told uh, when they're giving the background of the uh, first juvenile court judge uh, in British Columbia. Uh, there, the scandal is so great that her uncle, who's the former mayor of um, Hamilton, he departs uh, because of ill health very conveniently just days before the wedding. He uh, departs with his entire family uh, to the Bahamas. There are nevertheless 200 people at this wedding and the gossip is rife. The day after the wedding, um, they assemble all the uh, presents, including the gifts from Japan, and depart immediately with her mother for California. And in California, uh, they clearly join uh, the progressive community in California, the bohemian community in California, and they spend the next 10 years wrestling uh, with the uncle, uh, and cousins to get money from the family. Uh, the, the, uh, her grandfather dies in 1890, leaving a substantial estate, which is then fought over by her mother and brother. Uh, her first son is born in born June 1st, 1891. He's a, he's a very large baby. She has a very difficult pregnancy and a very difficult delivery. Um, and the story goes that because of this difficult pregnancy, her husband Lee enters medical school. 
and he ends up graduating uh, from the University of California, and they clearly hope to make their lives in um, California. And it is a reminder of these close ties that we have, you know, between Canada and the United States, uh, and that California is just full of Canadians. And if you go and look through um, the uh, San Francisco newspapers, which I've now done, is that it is remarkable how often you see Canadians surface uh, in the discussions about uh, what the future, future of North America is going to be, what the future of uh, the West is going to be, and what the relations of men and women are. And she continues to write. She is kind of the California expert on the Canadian Northwest. So she writes uh, for the United States in American magazines throughout this period. She and her mother also buy feminist magazines and newspapers in San Francisco. So the money that they eventually manage to get out of uh, Hamilton is used to fund their career, their continuing career as uh, suffragists uh, in California. And in 1893, uh, there's the founding of the Confederation of Women. And, and I don't think it's peculiar that the term confederation uh, is being used, a confederation of women. And it, of course, it, it does remind us of Canada and confederation, since there are so many Canadians down there. And the officers of the Confederation of Women included uh, Emma Gregory, uh, Helen Gregory McGill's mother. And in this period in California, in, in the um, early 1890s, the mother and daughter are the same team uh, that they had been in Ontario. So that Helen has a second uh, son in 1894, and then after 1894, you can see her work appearing in newspapers uh, across the United States, often being picked up in Canada and sometimes in the United States. Um, and they're very much supporters of the San Francisco suffrage movement. Unfortunately, I've now looked at everything that's been published, I think, and all the theses on suffrage movement in California, which is very interesting in the period. Uh, and despite the fact I can find Emma and Helen very much in the uh, California press, and particularly in the San Francisco press, the work that's being done on suffrage in the United States is, they're not as, uh, the Americans are not as interested in Canada as we are in them. And so the Canadians sort of disappear. She's also, Helen Gregory McGill and uh, her mother as well, are very involved in the progressive literary circles of the day. She's clearly trying to make an impact as a, a new woman journalist. She's very involved with the group around San Francisco's Occidental Hotel, including Charlotte Perkins Gilman, who she hosts later on when she comes to uh, the United States. And also she gets introduced to um, the uh, Miller, who's the poet of the Sierras, and who's clearly, um, he's very avant-garde in the period. He's almost disappeared from note in American literary history now, but was uh, very much entertained his contemporaries with his close uh, relations with uh, Japanese young men in particular. Uh, but also a, a, a literary circle that uh, is very reminiscent of uh, the um, uh, queer uh, literary group that was uh, active in San Francisco in this period. She also meets Susan B. Anthony, who's very involved again in, in, in the California suffrage campaign. But all that story gets, of course, forgotten when she moves north. Well, what happens uh, to send them out of California, they don't depart California willingly, uh, is that they're bankrupt in 1896 and indeed have to flee uh, to leave their creditors. And that's not a story uh, that's told either. And the details of it are now hard to, uh, hard to recover. Okay, so they, they head off to Minnesota, and at this point, Minnesota is um, the center of a great deal of progressive activity. And in particular, uh, Lee Flesher hopes that he's going to find uh, a position in the Mayo Clinic. In point of fact, that never appears. He ends up becoming a railroad doctor, then he becomes a civic physician. Uh, but on his way to California, 
uh, he's remembered as someone who saved a Negro cowboy. And this is part of this memory, um, which comes up in My Mother the Judge, is part of the establishment of the credentials of the first husband, who clearly is, again, an attractive, progressive individual um, who dies very young. But he settles in uh, as a physician in Farab Faribault, uh, Minnesota, the so-called Athens of the West. And the Athens of the West is now best known as having uh, some of the earlier uh, eugenic sterilization uh, <coughs> experiments in its hospitals. And so, of course, the first thing I think is, how involved was he with this? Now, the recent prize-winning uh, story of Faribault called Fixing the Poor by Molly Lee La T Taylor from uh, Toronto, has really argues that it's not about race politics in Minnesota, which is with the exception of uh, a black, significant black population, who in fact don't appear in their hospitals very much, is about fixing the poor. And it's about addressing uh, problems of class uh, and indeed dealing with the uh, difficulties uh, that we're seeing to accompany um, the beginning of, of the industrialization of, of Minnesota. And Helen and Emma become very involved in this and appear in the newspapers as advocates of the Minnesota Border Board of Control, which takes over the hospitals. And it's not until the, uh, the First World War that the hospitals introduce sterilization legislation, but it's clearly something uh, they're headed towards. Uh, can't um, link Helen or Emma to any of that, but they're part of a, a conversation that's going on in the progressive Midwest in the United States. Then Lee Gregory Flesher dies, um, uh, basically of workplace injuries, in August 1901. And Helen and Emma find themselves in the American Midwest, very limited money, two young children. She becomes the exchange editor for the St. Paul Globe at $60 a month. And as far as I can tell, $60 a month is what they're living on, uh, because Lee doesn't leave any money. Then this next sort of uh, stage in her life is when she marries uh, uh, John McGill. And this is when she comes to Vancouver at the beginning of the 20th century. And it's quite interesting that uh, my mother, the judge, uh, when, she treat, when Elsie treats her father, it's much less sympathetic than uh, her, uh, uh, the first husband. He becomes, he is presented very much as a baffled, divided man, a man who's very difficult to live with, who seems to be living, if you read between the lines, with significant problems of depression, um, and someone who seems to be, although he's credited as a feminist, he certainly, as the uh, immigration agent for the federal government in Vancouver, he's much more conservative, um, sometimes clearly reactionary, um, Patricia Roy would argue, in his dealings with Asian people. He's also an unsuccessful journalist. Uh, he's very active within the Anglican Church, and he seems to uh, get a very mixed press there. Uh, he doesn't really successfully, he's not very successful as a businessman or as a journalist or as a bureaucrat. He has a lot of enemies, as far as I can tell. They live in these quite modest circumstances uh, in the West End. Um, but she, he had been her suitor when she was at U of T. And he, as soon as Lee dies, he turns up. Um, and they marry in the uh, St. Paul uh, Cathedral. She marries him and almost immediately has two daughters. And the daughters then become uh, very well known in their own right, Helen and Elizabeth, 1903 and 1905, still accompanied by, their, by her mother. So Emma comes, she's clearly doing a lot of the housekeeping. Um, they live in this multi-generational household. A Emma is still not living with her husband who's living with uh, his son in Seattle and sometimes goes back and lives with his family in Montreal. As soon as Emma dies, uh, he, uh, her father, uh, Silas Gregory, arrives to live with them uh, until he dies, so it's again a multi-generational household. 
but they're also helped out by Sarah Ann Kirby, whose life rem remains, unfortunately, something of a mystery. Her sisters and she has relatives in the interior of British Columbia, but she's part of the missionary families that were involved at Six Nations. So she's a missionary at Six Nations, and then she comes uh, as a woman in her 60s and 70s in order to become paid help, and she is paid uh, the, uh, it as a, essentially a housekeeper and as a nanny uh, for the Gregory McGill family. At the same time, uh, Helen Gregory McGill has very poor vision. Uh, you know, one of the stories that we need to tell is how people cope with disabilities and how disabilities are remembered over time. And one of the things that's very often forgotten about uh, Helen Gregory McGill is that she had major vision problems. And this is someone who had to read like this and yet continued to read massively and to write, but her vision uh, was always a problem. She also comes to Vancouver and immediately sets up uh, friendships uh, with the Asian community, both Chinese and um, Japanese. Um, and they're in and out of her house. She also hosts visitors and she tries to introduce uh, British Columbians and Vancouverites to, in a very respectful way, to uh, Asian uh, civilization. At the same time, she's involved with a whole host of women's clubs and building a presence there that will be very important uh, for the suffrage movement. She's best known immediately in British Columbia, however, as a legal reformer, so very much echoing her grandfather's activity as a legal reformer uh, in equity in Ontario. The first book uh, that she writes is Daughters, Wives, and Mothers in British Columbia and some laws regarding them. And this book was um, uh, seen by many women and some men as well as being a incredibly uh, eye-opening expo exposure of the uh, disabilities under which women and children labor, labored in British Columbia. And so versions of this are republished right through uh, the 1940s. And revealingly, the first uh, uh, volume is dedicated to the Countess of Aberdeen. So when Lady Aberdeen comes through British Columbia, she spends time uh, again uh, with uh, Helen Gregory McGill. She also, quite early on, reminds us that being a suffragist uh, was a choice and that many women, and many men for that matter, did not make that choice. And she has this uh, commentary, which is very similar to a commentary that comes from Nellie McClung, that comes from Lady Aberdeen, that comes from Laura Jameson, that comes from uh, Helen Gray, uh, Hel Mary Ellen Smith. The chief stumbling block to the spread of women's suffrage among women was the attitude of the well cared for and comfortable woman whose invariable plea was that she was not interested in such things. Such a stand could be due only to ignorance of what she was withholding from others. The highest development of the community was only attained by the wise administration of laws justly framed. And when once all women recognized that any refusal to shoulder their responsibility as women citizens affected adversely the wronged and helpless women upon whom these very laws reacted adversely, they would soon realize their remissness as women and as Christians to their fellow human beings and shake off their selfish indifference. So this is the selfish woman uh, the gentlewoman that Nellie McClung talks about in times like these. She also uh, is very much part, she moves from being a supporter of the Tories when she comes, because her family is Tory in, in Hamilton, and she moves gradually into the Liberal Party um, and gives this talk for, in 1960, to Vancouver's Progressive Liberal Club, which was a suffragist organization and reminding that no organizations were as sensitive to the interests of humanity as the suffrage bodies. The men of Alberta and Manitoba, uh, who enfranchised women before BC does, have been fair and chivalrous enough to free the women of these provinces of the shackles which had prevented them from voting. So she's very much in keeping with uh, the suffragists uh, who really, uh, I think, identify quite clearly the indifference uh, of, of uh, many women, uh, not surprisingly, 
often since they're uh, very engaged in domestic responsibilities and because women are not encouraged to be political actors. Uh, but she identifies them as a significant problem. Another, and quite early on by 1912, so she's been in British Columbia about 10 years, she is the instigator of the movement to establish a room of one's own. Uh, the Women's Building, um, which is uh, unique in Canada, although there is an effort in Maple Ridge to set up a Maple Ridge Women's Building as well, which gets, it's not clear how far it gets, but it, they do try to do that in Maple Ridge, the suffragists there as well. And it is a building that's intended to provide facilities for really all of the uh, diverse women's groups uh, in uh, Vancouver, and also provide classes in typing, cooking, parliamentary procedure, uh, classes for the unemployed, daycare. Uh, they're constantly fundraising for this. So they're fundraising through drives uh, that begin in uh, 1912 and continue on right through the 1930s. And they're often very successful. They get significant uh, support, uh, popular support, and from uh, uh, some uh, monies that are, are given by wealthier women. 1940, however, it becomes a Salvation Army hostel for uh, uh, soldiers and is soon forgotten about. How am I doing on time? Um, sorry? Minutes after eight. Okay. Um, so I will finish up fairly soon. <laughs> Okay, she's very close, she maintains feminist networks. She's particularly interested in uh, Nellie McClung, who visits her regularly, Emily Murphy, who's an early uh, juvenile court judge in uh, Alberta. She, she is also distinguished uh, among the early judges because unlike uh, Emily Murphy in Edmonton, who is very much a supporter of eugenics and makes it quite publicly known and is also anti asian uh, quite loudly anti-Asian, she distinguishes herself as a far more progressive juvenile court judge uh, than uh, Emily Murphy. So as she's writing, um, she, she does she becomes a juvenile court judge in 1917. She, when uh, the uh, Liberal Party uh, becomes the government in 1916, it enfranchises women, and one of the benefits of enfranchisement is the appointment of the first uh, women judge. Uh, she immediately gets known as an outspoken woman judge who also demands uh, that uh, the larger context of women's and children's lives be examined, and particularly the economic difficulties uh, facing women. So she's a supporter of minimum wage and mother's pensions. She's seen to be a thorn in the side of the Conservative Party. She's for, uh, and when it comes to government in 1929, she's summarily fired despite the protests of uh, many uh, of the women and indeed progressive men uh, in Hamilton as well. She continues to write throughout this period on criminal reform. Uh, she becomes one of the leaders of Canada's penal reform movement. And quite notably, uh, she uh, points out that Asian children, Asian teenagers are not a problem, that they're well behaved, that their families have great expectations of them, and if they do rarely appear in courts, uh, their families uh, are there for them and will support them uh, through reform. She's also an activist for trying to get juvenile court uh, throughout the country and continues to write on them. Sterilization is a very minor part of her uh, uh, her program, and she sees that as far less important than dealing with poverty and dealing uh, with low wages, which she sees as the two critical issues that are causing an increase in juvenile delinquency. She continues also to entertain um, Asian visitors. So she's one of the feminists in Vancouver who can be expected to entertain Japanese and Chinese and indeed Indian visitors when uh, they come to Vancouver. She's also trying to come to terms in the 1930s, as many people are, with uh, the disappointments associated with suffrage. Why aren't there great changes? 
And she puts it as very much in the same uh, way that Nellie McClung does, and indeed Laura Jameson does. Great emotional movements such as women's suffrage surge to the flood and fall again to the ebb, only to rise again when need calls. There will always be women and men to serve noble causes to the death, but no cause will continue forever at white heat. So she's just trying to come to terms with her disappointment. What is not disappointing are her two daughters. So uh, one daughter becomes one of the leading American sociologists, Helen McGill uh, Hughes, who graduates from McGill. Um, she's one of the women who fights for equal nationality. Uh, she's also secretary of the Quebec League for Women's Rights. She gets a PhD in sociology from the University of Chicago in 1936. And they write a very, she and her husband, Everett, who's the most well-known of uh, the sociologists coming out of McGill and going back to Chicago, uh, where peoples meet racial and ethnic frontiers from 1952. And the beginning of that book says, leave your prejudices behind. Ask yourself whether you believe the right to equality of opportunity belongs only to those who are without fault, and especially ask where you would be if it did. And then her daughter, um, Helen, writes a very revealing article, Wasp Woman Sociologist, in Society for 1977, uh, talking about the influence of suffragism in her family. The second daughter is even better known today uh, as the first woman to get a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering, uh, first woman to earn a degree in Aeronautical Engineering from the University of Michigan, uh, and someone who battles with polio, just as her mother battles with uh, eye problems. Uh, she's significantly disabled uh, throughout her life, uh, but continues uh, to make uh, significant, uh, has significant achievements. She's the chief engineer for Canada's Hawker Hurricane fighter planes from 1939 to 43. A very controversial relationship. She's clearly uh, in love with and living with uh, uh, the uh, plant manager for Canadian Car and Foundry. They eventually marry after he gets a divorce. And then she's very active in the women's movement of the 1960s and 1970s, including being a member of the Royal Commission on the Status of Women. And in 1985, is designated a National Historic Person. And of course, today, just this summer, is now on the loony. So where are we? Recovery is still for beginning. Um, it reminds us of the significance of families, which is a story that's just often forgotten. The importance of all these local, national, and global feminist networks um, that uh, just surface, just really, and, and newspapers are wonderful for this, but you often just get names, unfortunately. That also the women and the men who choose to be feminists and suffragists face continuing resistance and penalties throughout their lives. As I said, uh, Helen Gregory McGill dies she, the only way she manages to support herself, uh, and she's active writing on criminal justice right till she dies in 1947, is her daughters are supporting her. There's, there's really no money left. Um, she gets an honorary degree from 19, in 1938 from UBC. 1998, she's designated a National Historic Person. Um, and this is a person who may well and is, like all of us, flawed, but significant achievement. And I think it reminds us that you really have to unpack these stories about, uh, you know, race relations, about uh, what's happening over the course of an entire lifetime, because people evolve. Um, they change their opinions, they become different people over the course of their lives. And Helen Gregory McGill starts off as a very privileged young woman, you know, debutante in Hamilton, and becomes radicalized by her own experience uh, as a woman who has great difficulty in finding economic independence, um, but very influenced as well by leading figures, both in the United States and Canada, before she appears in British Columbia, and then remakes herself uh, as, a, as a, a juvenile court judge and as someone who's very outspoken. So just a reminder that these are the kinds of individuals. Helen Gregory McGill is not alone. Uh, we need uh, to recover 
more stories, uh, and I suspect they will only enrich in our understanding of the suffrage and feminist movement from the period. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Nikki. This was really interesting. I have to say, I, I had not known about this lady and um, until the, the toonie came, the movie came out this, this summer. I haven't seen the toonie yet. No, neither have I.